So welcome everyone to our first event um, for the Tume Liverpool Irish Festival, the Invisible Women's Strand. And thank you so much to Emma Smith and the organizers for inviting uh, the Tume Oral History Project to participate, but also other members of uh, academia, survivor community, and uh, with a more general interest in how the history of Ireland's institutions has had an impact in uh, the UK in particular. So I'm very lucky to have this, this panel here um, this morning. Um, and I, I will go around the room as I see them. Um, we have uh, Rosemary Adasser, who uh, has a BA, a master's in science, and is a survivor of five Irish institutions. Uh, Rosemary is a founder and former CEO of the Association of Mixed Race Irish and a member of the Collaborative Forum. And uh, she has said herself she was finally and joyously reconnected with her lost family. Um, next on my screen is Teresa O'Sullivan, who uh, participated in the Tumor and History Project and has been very active as an advocate uh, and a survivor um, around the commission and the report. And uh, Teresa will tell you more about herself during the panel, but uh, it's been a privilege to work with Teresa and Rosemary over the last few years. Um, then we have Dr. John Cunningham, who is a lecturer in history in NUI Galway and also the co-PI of the Two Moral History Project. And John has worked a lot in the history of labor and class and is also the co-director of the Irish Center for the Histories of Labor and Class. And last but certainly not least, we have Mairead Enright, who's a reader in feminist legal studies at Birmingham Law School. And Mairead is currently a Leverhulme Research Fellow and her project, Laws Inheritances, is looking at the recent state rep responses to so-called historical institutional abuse and looking at elements of the legal culture that enabled the abuses in the past. So we have a fantastic panel here. Um, I suppose because this is the first panel of the day, I'll briefly say that uh, the Two Moral History Project has been running for the past year and a half and you can find out more on our website and you're going to hear more from those that have participated um, throughout the day. Um, so I'm going to go to you first John, can you talk to us about where uh, the commission came from in 2015 really because mm -hmm. some of the people um, watching may not be aware of the, the context there. I suppose um, you could go back a bit for context maybe and a light, light began to be shone on Irish institutions really since the 1990s um, with uh, investigative uh, work of uh, Mary Raftery and then subsequently you have the, the Ryan um, report, several commissions and so on. Um, same time survivors of institutions like um, uh, uh, Shen Ross Abbey and Bespra were drawing attention to issues of uh, forced adoptions, forced labour, and indeed uh, forcible incarcerations. And uh, the 2013 film, uh, Philomena, with uh, Judy Dench and Steve Coogan, had a significant impact, I think, as well. But by then, already, uh, Catherine Corliss was researching the Chewham uh, mother and baby home. And uh, she describes this, uh, the process there, um, of how she became um, a, a, a researcher, a historian, essentially, um, in that period, uh, look, uh, following uh, up uh, the sources uh, for the uh, uh, mother and uh, baby home, uh, as it was called in Chew, the institution was called in Chewham. Uh, so um, 
she first published her research in um, a local journal, the Journal of the Old Shoeham Society in 2012, but I suppose it came to wider attention in from about 2014 uh, when it was taken up in national media. Certainly, uh, Corliss uh, established that uh, 796 children had died uh, in the Chewham home in the 36 period, the 36 year period of its operation. She also highlighted the extreme disrespect uh, shown to the remains of the deceased, their burial in uh, disused uh, sewage facilities in the grounds and so on. So the outcry following the dissemination of Corliss's research uh, really led to the establishment by the government in uh, uh, 2015 of the Mother and Baby Homes Commission. As most of you know, the Commission's report was finally published early uh, this year, and it had uh, it has faced uh, criticism uh, both on the grounds of its processes and its conclusions, and we'll get to, to those later. Thanks, John. And I suppose you're like myself, a historian. So um, we like these institutions, the mother and baby homes, as they were as they were uh, known at the time, or children's homes. Um, like, where did they emerge from? What's the, what's the background to to those as opposed to other institutions, well, like the I, industrial schools or, or yeah, others? I think you have to go back to the foundation of the state, arguably before that. Um, prior to that, you have uh, the workhouse system, the poor law system, with these large institutions which cater. Uh, for, uh, for for for, for um, people in need of shelter, regardless of their circumstances, um, the system was cruel and oppressive in in various ways, and it came to be seen to be uh, disgraceful, really, by the late nineteenth, early twentieth century. There were um, reports like the Vice Regal Commission and the and the Poor Law, which argued for abolition and so on, but little was done. However. Uh, in the revolutionary period, um, the uh, matter was taken up, and you see it, uh, it there in the democratic programme of the revolutionary first doll in January 1919, where it's a commitment, and I'll quote here, uh, to abolish the present odious, degrading and foreign poor law system, substituting therefore a sympathetic native scheme. So the government, that through the uh, department, uh, the Dawes Department of Local Government sets about giving effect to that kind of commitment um, through local authorities and so on. And of course, as all of this is going on, there's great disruption in the in the country. The workhouse system, the workhouses are disrupted. They're occupied by um, British Army, and uh, others are burnt down by the IRA to prevent this happening. Um, at the other, on the other hand, you also have. I suppose, a sense uh, that there's an air of change and people are looking to what the new order will look like in the area of social provision. The Catholic Church in particular is playing uh, close attention to what's going on. And if you look at, uh, say, the Irish ecclesiastical record, where a lot of these debates um, uh, are, are carried out, uh, you see that they're kind of uh, essentially trying to figure out how they will uh, increase their kind of um, the, 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 their, their control, how they can better exercise social control and so on. And you see, and I have a quote somewhere here, if I can find it, uh, uh, there are articles in this journal with titles like How to Deal with the Unmarried Mother. And I just, um, one, um, uh, advocates the establishment of institutions for girls who got into trouble, uh, as the phrase was, and they needed to fulfil three key objectives. Uh, one, to shield her from further, quote, degrading and corrupting influences. Also, and this was a considerable um, um, part of the thinking of the time, to seek safeguard the children um, from the designs of proselytising Protestants. And uh, thirdly, to have a deterrent effect on the girls of the neighbourhood. So they had to be unpleasant and there had to be a generous sense of what they were about. So you have then the commitment, as I said, being um, um, followed through. 
with uh, successor institutions established, county homes, county hospitals, and the children's home stroke mother and baby uh, institutions. Um, and um, the, uh, I suppose, in terms of reform, it's significant that they continue to use, by and large, the previous grim Victorian buildings for these institutions. To get quickly to the um, Chewham, uh, the, the home for County Galway, I suppose, which concerns us here, um, that was initially established in Glenamady in uh, 1921, just at the moment that Michael Collins, Winston Churchill, Lloyd George and so on are negotiating the treaty in London. The County Council uh, decides that a mother and baby institution uh, would be uh, described as a children's home at the time would be established in the workhouse in Glenamady. Now, Glen that was all very well, except for a few months earlier, uh, the Glenamady workhouse had been burnt down by the IRA for the reason that I mentioned earlier. So it was a very inappropriate um, a kind of uh, a, a building to locate um, the, the, the institution in. You have then the um, uh, uh, attention drawn to the um, deficiencies of Glenamady, and it's drawn uh, by the very high mortality rate that there were mm. in those years. Uh, it takes four years to close the place down, um, despite outcry from almost uh, from the beginning. And then it's moved to the now familiar uh, building in Chewham, also a workhouse building. And uh, it was um, a barracks for the previous five years. Uh, I should say that the nuns, that the, um, the, the, the um, religious orders, the Bon Secure congregation, who had been nurses in the Glenamady workhouse were placed in charge. And um, uh, so they moved with the institution uh, to Chewham in 1925. Um, and they objected to the conditions there, um, which were kind of, and uh, over the following decades, kind of the um, complaints of, the, uh, of, of those in charge were grudgingly attended to by the County Council. And we have a description towards the end of the life of the Tume Institution in the late 50s, um, which describes this drafty, uh, bleak um, uh, institution, which was the description could have come from the 1850s, from the famine era, as, 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 as well as it come from the uh, 1950s. Ultimately, then, um, I'm going on a little bit long here. Ultimately, then, um, it was uh, decided that necessary renovations um, weren't, uh, to, couldn't be carried out in, and the place closed in uh, 1961 with the uh, uh, children and mothers who were there moved to other institutions and the uh, sector, if we can call it that, uh, continued into uh, the 1990s indeed. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, so like that's already an example like of one institution that from the beginning there's is huge issues with conditions, infant mortality. Everyone's aware of this. That's 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 pretty pretty kind of certain from that. Um, Mairead, I want to move to you. The commission is set up. The terms of reference. Can you talk through them? And then, I suppose your your take on the report after after it was published or, or your reading since then? Yeah, sure. Um, so the terms of reference are kind of published and online for anybody who wants to Google them. Basically, the uh, government sets up this commission of investigation. Um, there are three main uh, commissioners. Uh, the chair is uh, Judge Yvonne Murphy, who has been involved in similar kind of investigative work for the state before. Uh, the uh, retired professor of history, Mary Daly, and retired professor of law, William Duncan, and then they have a team of researchers working under them. And their remit is quite limited. Uh, first of all, they're only looking at a sample of institutions, a sample of mother and baby homes and county homes uh, that were in operation in relevant ways between 1922 and 1998. Chum is one of those 18. And their remit basically is to look at uh, whatever information they can find or is made available to them on conditions within the institutions, how they were regulated, whether and how they were inspected, 
um, differences of treatment of particular um, cohorts. So for example, where travelers were mixed race children treated differently than others, were disabled uh, women and children treated differently than others. Um, and what was the state and religious involvement um, in the institutions? And there are a couple of um, limitations to the terms of reference besides just the question of scope of time and institutions. So one, which might be important later when we're discussing Northern Ireland, is that the commission didn't have any remit to help in individual cases. So if you were having difficulty tracing relatives or finding out what happened in your case or accessing your records, as is very common for many people affected, the commission had no remit to help you. Um, the second thing was that um, the commission uh, had power to make recommendations and it did make some recommendations for state action. And that power included the power to recommend further investigations in places where it had difficulty coming to conclusions. And there are a number of places where it says it did have such difficulty, but it doesn't make those recommendations for further investigation. And the third thing was that it was supposed to publish its working methodology. And that's a methodology is one of those vague academic words, but what it really means is how did they decide what was true and false? How did they come to their findings? If you had, um, let's say, files or records or government reports that contradicted what witnesses were telling the commission, how did they decide which to favor? How did they strike a balance? And um, the commission gives us very, very little information about how it did that. But in subsequent debates about the flaws of the commission, they certainly suggest that they took a very narrow kind of legalistic approach, which seems inappropriate because like nobody's on trial here, this isn't litigation. This is supposed to be a broader commission uh, of investigation. And then maybe the last thing just to say is how they took um, evidence from affected people and particularly people who had been in the institutions either as children or as women and girls. And so the commission distinguishes between an investigative committee and a confidential committee. And most people who had personal experience or family experience of the institutions, over 90% went to the confidential committee. And they went to the confidential committee because first of all, it was the most advertised, right? But also because it was supposed to be non-adversarial. You weren't going to be directly questioned by let's say lawyers for the religious orders. And the terms of reference are quite vague on what should be done with the evidence given to the confidential committee, and the report calls it evidence. But basically, one of the big disputes that's emerged in the aftermath of the publication of the report is that it seems that most of the confidential committee evidence um, did not inform the commission's ultimate findings. So if you open the report itself, the confidential committee evidence is in its own section. There are all kinds of... Um, valid and substantiated disagreements about even how that section of the report is presented. So, you know, people who gave evidence to the uh, confidential committee say, my evidence was misrepresented, it was misquoted, it was selective, I wanted to raise these issues and I was told those issues were irrelevant and so on. But the, the other thing is that the bulk of that evidence seems to have been treated as the commission itself says as stories and only a very limited number of people were able to convince the commission to to quote from and rely on their personal testimony in the investigative section. And so it's the case, for example, that there are some of the institutions, you know, you look at the report, it has a chapter in each of those 18 institutions. And for some of those 18, there's no personal testimony taken into account at all. And the work of the CLAM project actually in taking affidavits from people and providing pro bono legal advice and pro bono legal representation was essential even to getting that limited amount of oral evidence into the process. So there's a big, you know, in terms of the methodology question for both historians and lawyers, and I think there's a big issue here, the question is how do we treat oral history evidence? And if we don't take it seriously, well then of course uh, what, you know, textual archives are going to dominate, state reports, records created by institutions which thought of women and children in the ways that John has outlined, you know, they're being taken more seriously. How do we think of that as a truth recovery process, right? So then in terms of the criticisms, I mean, just to kind of rattle off the headlines, like this is not a comprehensive critique, right? So when it was published in January, the first thing would be to say, you know, for those of us thinking about these 
institutions as places where serious human rights violations took place. The first thing is that the commission says in its own report, we did not take a human rights approach. And so that means that certain harms are just kind of presented as like bad luck or tragedy or things that are, you know, happened in the past, wouldn't happen today and aren't really the state's problem. Whereas if you take a human rights framing and Maeve O'Rourke's work has been, you know, crucial for all of us here, you start to say, well, certain things that happened in the institutions are still the state's responsibility. It has a responsibility to investigate, to offer financial reparations and so on. So some of the issues include, you know, very high mortality rates in the institutions, both maternal and infant mortality. That's not just a tragedy that suggests that the state did not act adequately to protect the right to life of those citizens. And the state also has uh, obligations now of investigation, tracing and so on in order to attempt to redress some of that harm. And um, there's no recognition of institutional racism at all, which I'm sure Rosemary will want to talk about. There is no recognition of physical abuse. And there's a really, uh, I suppose, immature comparison with um, the Ryan report. So they basically say what happened in the mother and baby homes was not comparable to what happened in the industrial schools. But perhaps maybe the most glaring, like this there's, there's isn't a hierarchy of abuses, but the best example of the kind of problem, if I can give one illustrative example, because I know it'll be of interest to people in Liverpool looking at the forthcoming uh, parliamentary inquiry into forced adoption is the Irish Commission finds no evidence of forced and commercial adoption. And just on forced adoption, it says, even though women didn't really have a choice, right? Now, that's a real problem. What they say is there was no evidence of forced adoption because under the law in operation at the time, the requirements for consent, which were minimal, though they changed throughout the period, were generally speaking met, or at least we have no evidence, whatever that means, that they were not met. But from a human rights perspective, you would say, well, look, these women and children, and indeed in many cases, the wider family or the father, had rights to private and family life, and the state did not act to vindicate those rights in any way. And that's the kind of finding, you know, that we would have expected this kind of commission um, uh, uh, to make. So there's a tendency to just kind of apply the law that was enforced at the time without recognizing the kind of points that John has made, that those laws were enacted within a system which sought to punish and deter unmarried motherhood and which even more broadly didn't allow uh, women and girls very much choice about when and how um, to have to have their children. Um, and then there, you know, just more briefly, there are other things to kind of bear in mind, the, all kinds of questions of process, which I'm sure Teresa and Rosemary will raise, how people were treated when they sought in good faith to give evidence to the committee, all kinds of questions about transparency and openness. It's very significant, for example, that despite all this criticism, none of the commissioners have agreed to come out and answer questions in public. There was a scandal even before the report was published because it was clear that the communication around how the records of people's testimony would be treated and how they might be archived or preserved, that hadn't been dealt with properly, even though there are clear legal rights in terms of personal data. And so we had this very unedifying last minute scramble uh, to, to preserve audio records of people's testimonies. And then just the last thing is the spin at the end of the report, uh, or sorry, at the beginning of the report, where it kind of says, well, you know, this was mostly a family problem. You know, why did women end up in these institutions? Why did children end up in these institutions? If we're all honest, it's their family's fault. Now, the question of justice within families, in my view, although the state has a role in supporting that justice to be done within families, is broadly speaking a family matter. This, you know, there's no, there's no way for the you holding family members accountable, doing justice within families, sorting out family history. Lots of families are trying to do that in their own ways. The bigger question for a state commission of investigation is what did the state do? And there's clear evidence, but there aren't clear findings in the report. The state funded these institutions, the state regulated them, the state was not only aware of abuses, but documented those abuses. The state agents, including particularly the guards, the courts, were involved in sending and returning women to institutions and were aware of transfers between institutions. And mo most importantly, the state law, again, maintained and encouraged the use of those institutions. And even the law today, 
like looking at the struggles we're having, for instance, to get people access to records of their own or their family members institutionalization, adult adoptees are still looking for basic rights to access their birth information, their early life information. The current law in Ireland inhibits accountability and family reconciliation. So maybe the last point I'd make is if people want to see how this could have been done differently, First of all, the Clon project produced a report, their own report based on their own evidence gathering process well in advance of the commission that did apply a human rights framing and that gave a sense of how things should have turned out. And then after the commission um, uh, published its report, a bunch of uh, legal academics, including myself and, and over 20 others, I think, went through the executive summary, went through all of the evidence that the commission had published with all its flaws. And we still found that even with all of the screw ups and omissions, there was still enough evidence to find that serious human rights violations have been committed. So it's important for people to realize, right, the question of framing, of selectivity of evidence, but also of the questions you ask when you start out in the investigation, these things matter. So a lot of the fluff about, well, the evidence wasn't there, this was scholarly, this was objective, that's just not the case. And historians, lawyers, activists, all kinds of people, people who were involved in the process as survivors, as family members, as adoptees, have all come out and poked a thousand different holes in this process. So it's important for people to be aware, I suppose, if they're looking at an Ireland and wondering what's going on, that this process was contested from the beginning. And in particular, the report is still in the process of contestation. So that's probably uh, enough, more than enough for now. Thank you, Mairead. That There's so many things that as well will be picked up on all day in different panels, which is which I really think is so important. I'm going to now, Rosemary and Teresa, I'm going to go to Rosemary first. Rosemary, you gave evidence. Yes. Um, I was one of the very few people who went before the investigative committee. Um, so my perspective is very much that of a survivor, as I said, of five institutions, including a mother and baby home as an infant, and also as a mother whose child was forcibly removed from me. There's no question in my mind about this. I wanted to just quickly touch on John's idea of, you know, the sector of the Irish institutions. It was a sector. It had a financial model. It's a myth. It's an absolute myth for when the church says that they were there full of charity, all the other good stuff. I can promise you no child was ever accommodated in these institutions without an accompanying cost code in their ledger. It was a total myth, which is why some women had to go to work. And we know in the case of Bespera, there was double entry bookkeeping going on. The women were going to work, but Bespera was still charging the Irish state for maintenance for the child. Um, you then look at, uh, and, and indeed with all the, the cruelty and everything else, what we, need, what we cannot forget is how it felt like for the women and children in these institutions. And the first thing to look at within this sector was a language of shame, stigma, disgust. So that you had uh, the wonderful, was it John Charles McQuaid and Richard Devine or those people, but they refer to us as purveyors of syphilis and diseased infants that our infants will be born blind. And when they're talking about, and they're far more worried about the moral salvation of the women than they're ever aware about their physical health or indeed that of their children. And one of the things I suppose that always really, really annoyed me was the terms that were actually brought in by the church and state to criminalize mothers. We were called first offenders, second offenders, third offenders. If you were a first offender, you could go into a mother and baby institution. I refuse to call them a home. If you were a second and third offender, you went into a workhouse. And one of the things I've always maintained is that to go into a workout, workhouse was to enter a penal colony. The mothers were, were, were expected to look after the sick, the disabled and the children. I have friends whose playground was the workhouse's mortuary. I mean, the, the morgue. I picture that. And this is, if you like, the environment. And we can never get away from that. And when the church is talking about protecting young girls from uh, uh, moral 
uh, decrepitude. What they're not mentioning, one of the things I really disliked about this report is that when young girls as young as 12 were being raped by their own families or by strangers, the blame for the child, it was the child's fault. You know, so so this is the environment. And, we, and, and when we're talking about these institutions, we cannot ever forget what the environment, the lived environment was for the women. So when the commission talks about our stories, these weren't stories, these were our, these were our lives. We lived these lives. Turning to the commission itself, um, as soon as I knew that the commission was going to be implemented, I and other members of the Association of Mixed Race Hours, we worked like donkeys trying to get race uh, as part of the terms of reference. And we did, uh, thanks to the help of some wonderful TDs like Maureen O'Sullivan. Um, now, the problem was though, that after lots, oh, <laughs> one funny thing. The first time I and a colleague of mine went to meet with two of the commission was Judge Murphy and Mary Daly. And the first time we entered into these august offices and introduced ourselves, Ms. Daly went, no, 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 there, there were no black people before the 90s. There were no black people before the 90s. And I just thought, OK, uh, I'm in my 60s. My colleague is in his 70s. Um, how, and if this is your starting point, we have a lot of work to do. If you're saying people of African descent or minority ethnic people did not exist in Ireland before the 90s, we have a very low starting point. So we were at pains to give them as much evidence as we could about the history of mixed race Irish in Ireland since the formation of the Irish state. We, after lots of negotiations, um, we finally got the commission and I have their letter saying that they will at least assess race and racism according to Irish Equality Status Acts. And we thought, great, all right. And then myself and my community, we worked tirelessly to get us all to engage with this. Many of us were actually from the UK because Amory was started in the UK. So, and there was, there was a slight problem from day one. Um, quite a few of us wanted to go before the investigative committee, but at some point a decision was made. We were promised all of us could go before the investigative committee, but at some point there was a decision made no more investigative committee. Everybody henceforth was to be shunted into the confidential committee. And then the argument was, well, if you go before the confidential committee first, then you can go to the, to the investigative committee. And we challenged the commission about this, especially since a number of us felt that we had been um, victims of the vaccine trials. And there were at least three mixed race Irish who had evidence that they were part of the five in one vaccine trials. A slip on their record, but they had written evidence that they were part of these vaccine files. And I pushed, pushed, pushed for these people to go before the investigative committee. No, no, only four of us from, from the association managed to get through. Then the commission said, okay, uh, we're gonna go, because then of course we pushed for the commission to come over to the UK and they did not allow anybody else to go before the investigative committee but they did say you can come and speak to the confidential committee oh okay fine what the problem with the confidential committee apart from all the things that that Maraid has highlighted the biggest problem with the confidential committee was that the most vulnerable people were simply unable to participate why because they were not allowed to have anybody in the room with them they weren't allowed to have family members, uh, advocacy groups. We all had to stay outside. Furthermore, there was no counselling before or after. And this is the case over in Ireland as well. These, you know, hundreds of us, as we now know, went in to give our evidence, you know, spew your pain and history in front of these two people who are not even trained and then take the bus back home and go to work. So the most vulnerable were simply not yeah. able to participate. I'm, I'm very angry about that one because it was their, their voices were lost. 
as part of this process as well, um, apart from my own individual appearance, um, Emery produced its own, if you like, community report. And one of the things that we asked was, how come so many of us were born in the UK but found ourselves in Ireland? They had no answer for that. Then we asked, well, and how come so many of us appear to have been adopted but there are no adoption papers? And again, another interesting nugget, uh, much to Judge Murphy's um, chagrin was, was revealed. The lovely Mary, and I do like Mary, I do like Mary. We were asking how come there were so many people that were apparently adopted but, but weren't adopted. And Mary Daly said, oh, so that was very common. That was very common. You know, the, the, many families couldn't afford to feed the children. So, yes, so the state provided uh, uh, maintenance until the child was 16. Judge Murphy, we can't conclude that. We can't conclude that. I thought Judge Murphy was going to lean across and throttle Mary Daly. <laughs> it was just one of those. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I like Mary, I like Mary Daly. You know, she's up front. Um, but as I said, so that, if you like, is the investigation. So we then come to um, the actual report itself. And like every other survivor, we waited with bated breath. And then to find that there was a finding that there was no racism. The methodology did not include any reference to a letter I had from the commission saying that they would assess racism using Irish Equality Equality Acts. What happened? Then there were the descriptions of us. They dredged up 267, I think the number was, from 14 mother and baby institutions and four county homes. But we were all African. We're all Nigerian, apparently. Or the Greeks and Spanish were also mixed race as well. It was like, what was going on here? Um, and then so there was a bit of racism, but it was kind of it was the order of the day. I can promise you, if you were on the receiving end in institutions from the racism that I and my community and the disabled community and the traveler community experienced, this wasn't a little bit of casual. They actually use the word casual racism. Mm -hmm. So that was a big that was a big shock to us. Then the whole idea of um, let me see. Yes, it was the idea of no breakdown as to where the people who went to the confidential committee came from. You know, we don't know how many people came from the UK or America or France or Australia. We don't know what the breakdown is. Where do these people come from? And the other thing um, it didn't actually talk about, it didn't talk about at all was, and it was supposed to, under the terms of reference, it was supposed to look at the exit plans for all these children. There's no mention of exit plans anywhere mm -hmm. in the report. And when we were given our group submission, we took pains to point out the exit plans. For 90% of us, it was to industrial schools. And this is another link that's been completely ignored from the whole mother and baby um, report, because it does not talk about the sheer number of children who were shoved from the mother and baby institutions directly into industrial schools. Um, I should probably leave it at that. Uh, <laughs> I could go on forever. <laughs> Rosemary, thank you so much. There's so much to pick up on there in a, in a really great way. And um, Teresa, you also gave evidence to the confidential committee, wasn't it? Um, do you want yes. to pick up on whatever you like there, Teresa? <laughs> yes, um, and I very much, uh, I'm in awe right now at the moment, even listening again today after so many months and the collaborative approach that we have here now um, while speaking in the sense of, I have a pain in my heart right now again. And I think that's so important to say that today because when the report came out in January, the first thing that I was holding, I was holding anger, I was holding disappointment, I was holding, where did my confidential testimony go? 
who lost them in the archives and then they came back. That part for me was a very, very distrusting time, which had a huge influence on how I was going to respond to the report. And I suppose the big thing for me really was after the report came out, I was confused, I was disappointed, and I lacked a certain amount of direction. Where do we go? What was I supposed to do with this? Very much for me was, I turned to yourselves, NNUIG. I turned to politicians like Catherine Conley, who I have huge admiration for on the way she speaks politically. And there's many others like her in the dial as well that speaks from that platform. But I also looked for support in my own group, in our Troom Alliance group, with our own survivors. What did they think? What were they speaking about? We phoned each other on a very, very practical level and got support from one another. I also looked at the media. What were they saying in Facebook? What were they saying in Twitter? Had I got it wrong? Was there something that I didn't know? I know that I went to the confidential committee in a very trusting, in what I thought was a very safe place. So that to me was extremely important. We opened up our hearts. We really, really did from lifetime experiences. And I'm very much in tune there with two things that have been said here this morning, the word story, our life experience, and the word, it was not home, it was institution. And they are the words that are very, very strong with me when I was going in that day, that I wanted them to know exactly what my mom and I went through. And I'm very conscious for our situation here today that my mom had gone to England. My mom had a job over there and she had gone to have me. Her family had support to her because there was a few family members over there. So we were one of the families that had done their level best. They weren't a family that had ignored it. And a lot of it on the media and that they would blame families and that, and there certainly would be families that wouldn't have got it right either for many, many reasons. And I understand that too. But I think the biggest thing for me was the words contamination was huge. I found that extremely difficult to cope with it, that our testimonies where we spoke from the heart were contaminated. That to me, definitely, and I was so pleased that so many academics, so many historians, so many advocates, and the public at large, I thought they were absolutely outstanding. I think they turned the commission on its head. I think they really did because they were a gasp. And a lot of them wouldn't have known the struggles. A lot of them would be hearing it for the first time. And a lot of the youth, actually, I was very, very impressed by the youth as well going forward because they are our future generation. And what they were saying is, this is not right. This commission report has to be repudiated. Uh, there's a whole the host, like what Marit had said, a whole lot of academics, a whole lot of professionals that are saying, hold on here, we flagged this. We said things were not right a few years ago, halfway through it. To me, it's just not enough to say, well, we spent five years doing it. We may have been stopped at different parts, they were saying, because of legal stuff that came up. Tell that to the survivor and the, the mom who's sitting by the fireside at 70 or 80 years of age, and experiencing huge loss and what happened for what happened in an institution and then what happened to her little baby who she may never have seen since or is still holding huge pain. So it was about taking the commission and looking at it in a sense of, I was very much guided on what people were going to say because I was confused about it. 
I thought I did my part in a respectful, integrity way. I spoke from the heart. I spoke from my mom. She knows what went on inside in the institutions. She knows it was a forced adoption. I know it was a forced adoption. And it almost asked the question, were we being truthful in our life experience? We know that we were. And I think a big thing was, if she was to shine a light from heaven, which I know she is, looking down on the commission report, what would she say about it? And I think there's three things she'd say. A lot of it was not her experience. A lot of it was not true. And I have to say, there was stuff in it that was well researched as well. I will certainly give that credit as well in the findings and linking in. One final point, I suppose, that I'd have just bringing in about the church and the state. And this is on a very personal note in the sense of they all have accountability and responsibility uh, to every survivor that has gone through the system. And it is so important now. We have wherewithal now. We have fantastic academics. We have fantastic historians. We have many, many public people that are on our side. We have to get this right. And we will. Teresa, thank you as always. Um, yourself and Rosemary say it better than, than anyone could. Um, we, don't, uh, we don't have a huge amount of time left, so I, I want to flag the Northern Ireland report for what the Irish report could have been, because we may not have that much time to talk about it now. But I want to just talk before we end about redress, though, because I think that's really important to the people watching this. The panel is called See and Bear Witness. So the redress piece, um, I don't know, Rosemary, Mairead, anyone on the panel really, maybe everyone will say a piece on that, but whoever wants to come in first, because that's that's the next step really. I think um, very, very briefly on, on the redress, if it goes according to form, the ex-residents or detainees uh, from the UK and, and elsewhere will be cut out of the picture. Um, if you're looking at the 22 recommendations that the government has agreed to look at, to, to look at, to the best of my knowledge, there's nothing that actually includes the UK residents, uh, ex-detainees, I should say. Um, and I think that that, unlike the Ryan report, um, we no longer have those local advocacy support groups to advocate on our behalf. So really, it's up to the Irish centres like Liverpool, Leeds, London, you know, it's up to those centres to take up the baton. Um, I'll give you a really quick example. When Karanua came out, and I was actually on the board, what was very interesting was that of the 15,000 people eligible for uh, Karanua support, 5,000 were actually in the UK. The history of Ireland is that you've got more homeowners in Ireland than you do uh, uh, among survivors in the UK. The survivors in Ireland were able to practically rebuild their houses. The survivors in the UK, mostly within social housing units, couldn't get a cooker or a bit of lino. And that goes to the heart of the inequality that seems to be fundamentally built in when redress is an Irish centric uh, affair. That's that's my bit on that. That's so important, Rosemary, the call to action there for the Irish centres. Mairead, do you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, in terms of in terms of redress, a um, couple of things. You mentioned the Northern Ireland Research Report, and that was followed by a truth recovery uh, design panel, which has just published its recommendations, which unlike what's happened in Ireland, where the redress scheme process is being led by a private consultancy called Oak, uh, in Northern Ireland, they appointed um, Deirdre Mahan, Maeve O'Rourke, we've mentioned earlier, and Phil Scratton, who I know people in Liverpool will know really well from his work on, on Hillsborough. Um, so, you know, leading academic and civil service advocates for transition justice. And they've put forward their proposals for investigation, but also for redress. And the first thing that stood out to me about redress was 
they have proposed that redress payments should be available from the start of the investigation. So recognizing that redress will fulfill lots of different functions. Some people are very elderly. Some people, as Rosemary has said, their needs are urgent and their needs are very basic. Um, and some of the kinds of questions around poverty, inequality, ill health, you know, Maeve would say, and I would agree that these are continuing harms. You know, these are things that are traceable back to the inequalities that were reinforced um, in the institutions. So I, I think people should definitely have a look at the at the Northern Irish process and that that would be a good baseline for evaluating what comes out um, in the Republic. Um, in terms of redress, uh, I guess the key questions are eligibility. So who's going to be included? Uh, the second question is what harms will be recognised? So if we take into account that, as I said earlier, the Commission downplayed a lot of the abuses, um, what will the money payment actually be for? Um, I think the government has backed down on some of the Commission's more restrictive recommendations. So they had said, for instance, people affected post-1973 shouldn't be eligible for financial payments or people who spent less than six months in an institution shouldn't be um, eligible for payments. And that completely misrecognizes the nature of some of the harms, like particularly, not exclusively, but particularly if you're talking about a very small baby, a very small child, we know that it's not a question of duration, it's a question of intensity and that some violations like forced permanent secret separation from, um, from, your, from your parents are not getting um, basic care and attachment in the very, very early months of life that that can have very severe um, consequences. So it's good that government has been rethinking on that, but we would like to see, I guess, a more expansive redress program. And then and I'm sure Rosemary will talk about this because of her experience with Cara Nua, the process, the process for application, whether people are communicated with properly, whether they're asked to come up with records that they don't have access to, but their abusers do, um, whether they're asked to sign waivers, whether they're prevented from talking about the process, as has happened in other, um, in other uh, redress um, contexts. And then the last thing, just because Rosemary said survivor groups, especially in the UK and elsewhere, and to pick up on Theresa's point about contamination. This has been a recurring issue across previous redress schemes. There is a suspicion of survivors getting together, providing mutual aid, providing mutual support. When people support each other, they're supposed to be fabricating memories together or contaminating it. So like the ideal victim is the person who is docile and grateful and non-political and never has a bad word to say about anybody. And treating people like that and using money to continue treating them like that is also a continuation, a repetition of past abuse, especially because it's money. You know what Rosemary said earlier on, let's not pretend that these institutions, so visible in boarding out and elsewhere, let's not pretend they didn't have an economic function. Using money to discipline people is not justice. Us using money to discipline people is a repetition of that violence. A hundred percent. Yeah, Can I very, very I, quickly uh, come in? The really important bit about the Northern Ireland uh, uh, um, design panel was that it actually had survivors front, yes. centre, back, sideways. They actually co-designed yes. the, 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 the new strategy. I just wanted to get that in there. Yes, yes, definitely. That is, <laughs> which would seem like a fairly obvious approach yes. after the past 20 years, but mm -hmm. in particular. Um, Teresa, before John, I'm going to come to you at the end on, on oral history to, to finish this off and was responsibility for historians. But um, Teresa, on that question of redress and, and what's next, do you have anything I you think, want to add? Or? Um, yes, I fully support uh, what, what's been said so far. But what's coming to my mind at the minute is two things, is localization and professionalism and I think those two things I think every single person uh, when they're dealing with the redress whether it's the person whether it's a social worker whether it's the civil service personnel and um, whoever it is it has to be a person-centered approach I think every survivor now needs another meeting another meeting to say what would you like in this redress what is suitable for your needs because I think what happens is the TDs advocates for us some for and some against and they have their debates also the county councils are there so there's a huge responsibility of people 
that need to be accountable now as well and how they're going to support the person. I don't think it's enough to say we're going to give so much money um, a, B, and C, I think you find out what the person needs and you sit with them. And I'm very, very mm. conscious of the 11 million that was not spent on the commission when they were doing the report that time. So maybe to take that 11 million and do a person-centered approach mm. with each and every person that's affected, whether it be in England, whether it be in America, every single person that has been involved and has gone through such a traumatic time in the institution. Take the money and do it right. And I was very conscious of the word. It's our human right. So we deserve to be treated absolutely and tailored to every single person's situation. Ask them what they want. Thank you, Teresa. John, do you want to come in on that before we, we finish up? Give everyone time to have a cup of tea before the next panel. Yes. Well, I suppose, I mean, um, a lot of the points that I might have made at this stage uh, have been made already, I think, uh, by uh, the, the other uh, three speakers, in particular around the use of the oral evidence uh, that was, um, that, that was uh, gathered. Um, and uh, I suppose what was striking immediately was a kind of hierarchy of evidence, a privileging of mm. the records, the written record, uh, even though we knew that, uh, or anybody would know that, uh, that there were uh, that, 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 that there's problems around the way this record was created and the motivations of those who created it. Uh, so the privileging of that uh, type of uh, evidence, and then the uses of words, as, 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 as Teresa said, like contamination around the um, uh, the, the, the uh, oral testimony. Uh, that was uh, that was uh, uh, gathered. I mean, uh, there, there are methodolog methodological approaches uh, to oral history, which uh, takes um, takes uh, um, the, 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 takes all factors into uh, into account, and it should have been treated. Uh, the the, um, the, the it should have been treated in the same way as other evidence uh, uh, was. Uh, uh, should would be would be would be treated, and of course uh, we're uh, as far as our own processes in oral history are, are concerned, they're ongoing, and we welcome uh, people, um, we welcome uh, contacts from people, and we'd undertake uh, to travel to do interviews and so on as a, a necessary um, uh, to put on our own um, uh, in our, in our own archive and in the sort of uh, conditions determined by the uh, by the people given the testimonies. So thanks, John. Thanks, everyone, for being here this morning. Um, I think it raised a lot of questions. I don't know. I think we have a lot of answers. <laughs> but, uh, uh, the next panel after this is um, going to be with members who, who gave their, their oral history to the, the Two Moral History Project. So um, myself, you won't see any more myself and John, uh, but then we'll have the drama pieces later on. And uh, thanks again to Emma Smith and, and everyone in the Liverpool Irish Festival and, and you know, really looking forward to, to hearing the other panels for the rest of the day. So for now, Slán, see everyone soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.